Massimo, it's good to see you again. It's a pleasure to be here as usual, my friend. I think I have to say for the audience that this is the third time we've started this because <laughs> we've had some technical issues. Now it's not with the platform. We're on a new platform. We're using Zoom instead of Skype because we had a lot of trouble with Skype. But because apparently a Time Warner and it was taken over by a Bangladeshi operation that... Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's now called Spectrum, and uh, it's, we're all excited about the fact that we are paying more every month and getting the same shitty service as before. Right, but, no. you know. <laughs> so, um, but we 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 think we can even if we Massimo gets dropped that we can pause and, and work with it. So, um, we're going to start again. But we know this part really well. Um, so, Massimo, we're here on the occasion of the publication of your new book, which has already appeared in the uh, is already available in the UK with a different cover and is going to be available in the States on, you said Tuesday? Yes, this coming Tuesday, uh, May 9th. It's already out, as you said, in the, in the UK. And actually, the Italian translation is also already out. Right. Um, and uh, the book, of course, is How to Be a Stoic. And the first thing uh, we, we wanted to talk about, just a few minutes, is for you to talk a little bit about the writing of the book, um, that you, you, went to, you went to Italy and to other locations. I guess to uh, get the spirit uh, soak in some of the environment. You want to just talk a, a few minutes about about your travels when you wrote this? Yeah. So this this was uh, my first real sabbatical. Um, I I did have another sabbatical years ago when I was at the University of uh, Tennessee, Knoxville. But I used that one to write my dissertation in philosophy. Uh, that was the pre period when I was transitioning from biology to philosophy. So I didn't go anywhere. So this time uh, I had available a sabbatical. I wanted to write this book and I figured, okay, the book is going to be centered on the figure of Epictetus, uh, one of the most influential uh, uh, Stoic teachers, although he's rather little well known today compared to, let's say, Marcus Aurelius or Seneca. And uh, so I said, well, why, why not doing it uh, while I am actually living in a place where Epictetus spent a good chunk of his life? So I went to Rome. Of course, the fact that I have family there and they also have good food and wine really didn't enter into the discussion at all. But, um, you know, so I, I went to Rome and uh, Epictetus was there for a good chunk of his life because he was acquired by, as a slave, uh, by Nero's personal secretary. So he, so he was at the court of Nero. Before that, he was in um, uh, Hierapolis, which is modern day Pamukkale in, uh, in Turkey. So I went there uh, to visit as well. He was born there. And uh, he, he spent his, the first years of his life as a slave with a different master who apparently was pretty brutal. Uh, at some point, in fact, he beat Epictetus enough to, to break his leg. And there's a really nice little episode in the, uh, in the discourses where Epictetus actually uh, tells the story. And he says that, uh, that um, he told the master, he says, you know, if you keep doing this, you, you're going to break my leg. And then, of course, the, the leg broke. And Epictetus says, well, I told you so. <laughs> You shouldn't have told me. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Probably. But You're annoying like, me, right? <laughs> keep coming. <Exactly. laughs> he was a little bit of a smart aleck, you know. Yeah. Um, and it shows, actually. That's one of the reasons I like Epictetus. He, he has a wicked sense of humor. Uh, but then he was acquired by sort of a much better master who actually, in fact, allowed him to study philosophy uh, as a slave uh, under Musonius Rufus, who was one of the most influential Stoic teachers in Rome. Then at some point... Um, uh, the Emperor Domitian kicked out both the, the Stoics and a number of other philosophers out of Rome, sent them into exile because, you know, the Stoics in particular had this bad habit of speaking truth to power, as we would say today. They were, they were critical of the regime. They were definitely critical well, of the regime. Were there any of the schools that did Domitian favor any of the schools or was he generally anti-philosophical and wanted them all out? He was uh, generally anti-philosophical, but the Stoics were particularly annoying because the, a lot of the senators were Stoics, and a lot of the actual ah. political, yeah, a lot, a lot of the actual political opposition came from the Stoics. Okay. The Epicureans, for instance, uh, practice a disengagement with politics, right. and so right. they were not a, not as much of a problem. So uh, Epictetus was sent into exile. He went to northwestern Greece to Nicopolis, and uh, he reestablished his school there, which became incredibly successful. He was. Uh, uh, one of the most influential teachers of the time. A lot of young uh, Roman aristocrats uh, went to his school to study, and the Emperor Adrian uh, later became uh, one of his personal friends. So I, I did uh, all of, a little bit of, the, of that. I, I stayed in Rome most of the time. I went to Aeropolis. I went to Nicopolis. And it was a lot of fun to sort of think that I was walking through the you know, Agora in Nicopolis, for instance, and think that, that uh, Epictetus probably walked there as well. 
Yeah, yeah. The, 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 I think people underestimate the uh, the significance of the writing environment. Um, um, and there's something about the ancient places that's really quite. You know, I've been to Israel a number of times, um, and you know, walk through Jerusalem. It's quite a remarkable experience. Just you can feel you can feel the history almost in a way that's uh, that's that's quite uh, quite uh, moving. Um, it's a, it's all it's a, as close as uh, a secular person like me gets to a transcendental experience. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. I can see. I totally see that. Um, so you mentioned Epictetus, and and I want to say to some very, uh, give a brief characterization of how the book is actually styled. Um, because it's very interestingly done, and I'd like to hear maybe a, you, you say a word about why you did it this way. So it's not really you in dialogue with Epictetus, like in the, in the, in the sort of a platonic dialogue. It's you t really talking to yourself, but All the right. voice that answers you oftentimes is Epictetus, and a lot of times it's directly quoted, or at least very closely paraphrased. And I'm, I think it's very effective, but I'm wondering what was the idea behind choosing this, or did this just sort of happen this way? Or did you have a conscious notion, hey, I want to do it this way because... Yeah, no, th th it was a combination. So, so I was thinking, f I was uh, trying to get, uh, uh, to think about a novel way of, of putting, you know, of writing the book, because otherwise, I, I just didn't want to put out yet another book on stoicism. There, there's a number of good books on stoicism, mm. and so it had to be something that that spoke, you know, in a in a different way to the reader, and that was much more personal. As you noticed, a lot of the episodes, not everyone, but a lot of the episodes that that occur in the book are actually things that happen to me. Uh, so yeah. it's yeah. everyday life kind of kind of things. Um, and well, so not also think, every day. There's one, <laughs> one about right. you escaping a military coup in Turkey. So it's not <laughs> exactly, not exactly every day. But yes, I yes, personal experiences. <laughs> in fact, that one happened after I finished the first draft of the book, and of course, immediately I went back and I said, I think this episode belongs to the book. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so, so I think I, so. One of the early ideas was to use Epictetus as a guide. Um, you notice that the book starts. Uh, with a quote from the Divine Comedy by yeah. Dante, not because I think that I'm any, anything like Dante, but because I always liked the idea that Dante had to pick a guide to go down into the uh, into Inferno and pick the, the, the Roman poet Virgil. And so in the same way, so in the same spirit, I picked Epictetus as my own guide to Stoicism. But then I also remembered that Socrates, again, not to compare myself to Socrates, uh, kept saying that he had these daemon uh, in his in his ear, right? Oh, he's that's saying, where I see. Yeah, so that's yeah. what it comes from, right? So the he diamond, this, yeah, 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 yeah. So he had this voice that was talking to him and mostly telling him not to do certain things. Um, and so I said, well, that's an interesting uh, uh, way of putting it. And uh, so, yes, I imagine having so these these uh, ideal conversations with Epictetus. You're right. Uh, very often, it's uh, he's talking straight from the discourses or it is very closely paraphrased. And so every chapter pretty much starts out with uh, either I make an observation or Epictetus says something, and then we have a little bit of a, of a, of a back and forth, and then I go on, I use that as a springboard to, to explore the particular topic. And let me ask you, uh, uh, why, and this will be the last thing on this, on this sort of, this sort of structural issue, why did you, um, why did you pick Epictetus? I mean, you said before he has a wicked sense of humor, um, yeah. but is it partly because his is am amongst the ones that we have the most writings from. Um, so there's, there's a lot of material to draw on. Uh, wh why Epictetus in particular, as opposed yeah. to, let's say, Marcus or Seneca? Um, I guess the Greeks, there's very little writing, so you really couldn't do Greeks, the Greek Stoics, right? That's right. There is yeah. very little. There's only fragments from the Greek Stoics from the early uh, history of the, of the store. Uh, most of the writings we have today are the, from the Roman Stoics, and particularly from the three you mentioned. Uh, now, for Epictetus, we have four of the original eight volumes of the Discourses, and then we have a short thing called the Manual or the, or the Handbook. Uh, but no, we have a lot more writing from Seneca. So then why Epictetus? Um, Epictetus has a number of interesting characteristics. First of all, as I said... Uh, you like his humor, humor, yes. I really like his sense of humor, uh, his bluntness. You know, he talks to his students. You know, the, the, the Discourses are basically... Uh, transcripts of, of his um, uh, lectures to the students. And he talks to his students in a very blunt, in a very, very down-to-earth, very uh, easy-to-understand way. Uh, but also, there is the idea that Epictetus also uh, was the most pious, for instance, of the Stoics. You know, the Stoics uh, did believe in a, in a god of, in, of a sort. He was a physical god made of matter. In fact, basically, the, the, the Stoic god was 
uh, the same thing as nature or the universe or or the or the rational um, ordering of the of the world of the logos. So a, a philosopher's god, not the not the right. Zeus Apollo type of no. god. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So so in fact, it's sometimes referred to as Spinoza's god because Spinoza pretty much got it straight from from the Stoics. He was very influenced by the Stoics. However, uh, there is variations in which in, in the way in which the Stoics talk about. God, uh, God as nature, and and Epictetus sounds at time, uh, at times a lot like almost like a Christian, and you know he was writing in the second century. He was kind of sort of aware of Christianity. Christianity at the time was still a, a fairly small sect, uh, but he sounds very pious. He, sound, he talks about God a lot, and um, and so one of the reasons I picked him is because of I have of course a very different concept of God or nature from Epictetus, and so I. Uh, some of the bits in the book are I'm actually arguing with Epictetus and I say, well, well, I mean, now, uh, uh, there's, you know, modern views are, are different on this thing. So in, for instance, Epictetus has in the discourses pretty much what we call today uh, the argument from design. So it, 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 it pretty much puts forth the argument from design for the idea that, that there must be some kind of a sort of general intelligence that created the universe. And so there I use that as a way to say, well, yes, but you know, my friend, we got David Hume and Charles Darwin, and after them, it's a, you know, that argument becomes much less convincing. Yeah. So it's also a way to show that stories can and needs, in fact, to be updated to the 21st century, taking into account, you know, progress in both philosophy and science. And yeah. I think Epictetus struck me as a, as a very good sort of sparring pat partner, basically, for this. Yeah, you know, it's interesting, actually, that something just occurred to me as you said that. Um, I think I think sometimes people will try to one of the criticisms people tr will, will want to make of some of these things is that, oh, well, you know, you're pulling this out of its ancient context and you're just sort of, you know, right. uh, you know, cutting and pasting it. And, but, and, you know, in truth, um, that's true of actually all the religions too. I mean, I mean, there isn't any religion that people, ancient religion that people, at least in the West are practicing in which they're not practicing a modern version. And even the Orthodox versions are modern versions, if you actually know exactly. <laughs> about how, how the theology evolves and all that sort of stuff. And so there, there is no really avoiding when, right. you, when you're talking about practicing any ancient system. Of, it has to be adaptable to, in some sense, um, or else uh, you're just going to be committed to too many things that, no, that nobody's going to commit to now, right? I mean, That's correct. Yeah. I think the only difference between, uh, so first of all, I agree with you, and also, of course, every religion, as far as I can tell, has a component of you know a philosophy as an embedded philosophy of life. I guess we're going to talk about yeah, the yeah, concept yeah. of philosophy of life in a minute. But um, th now, the difference, of course, is that if you take a text like the you know the New Testament as actually inspired directly by God, then it's going to be much more difficult to convince people, even 20 centuries later, that. You know, you want to do your own interpretation. You want to change your things because, you know, after all, you interpreted the, the word of God. Yeah. As you know, there's plenty of room for interpretation anyway. Yeah. But if we're talking about a secular text, you know, something that started out as a secular text, uh, Seneca, Epictetus, yeah. or Marcus Aurelius, I mean, it's not like, like they are the word of God. It's not like it's, it's something yeah. that was said by yeah. Epictetus, then it becomes yeah. sort of a commandment, so it's much yeah. easier. Yeah, well, I, the only thing I would say is, I mean, I mean, if you actually know the history of the the, theolo the theologies of these versions of Christianity, you'll know that that very fundamentalism is a modern idea. It's not, yes. it's not the That's way right. people thought in the ancient world. And That's so right. uh, even the fundamentalists are modern without realizing it or without admitting it. Um, but you're right. There's a sort of, a, there, there's, there's a missing layer of problem <laughs> that exactly. you don't have with, with the text or epic exactly. are, are openly but, but, written by men. Yeah. Particularly uh, uh, in a place like some of, some of the ancient philosophies, let's say, uh, you know, with, within, within Stoicism, Seneca several times says explicitly, we don't have all the knowledge. New, new generations will figure out new things. And he also says equally explicitly, you know, I'm, I consider myself a Stoic, but just because the early Stoics said something, I don't, I'm not bound by it. I have my own mind and I can, I can, you know, I can imagine yeah. and think on, on my own. So, yeah, let me ask you this one other thing by, about uh, the, just the, the, the context, because it just occurred to me and interests me, um, if, if you know the answer. Um, Socrates, of course, one of the things he, you know, he was punished for beyond um, uh, corrupting the youth was impiety. Was was, was right. uh, and we talked for a minute about you know how this the Stoics' God is the philosopher's God, not the Zeus Apollo gods. Um, 
was that a problem for philosophers generally politically in their societies? In other words, that they didn't accept that in a sense they were the equivalent of today's atheists and that they didn't accept the pantheon and they instead embrace, or did they sort of do a kind of double speak? Um, um, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, I mean yeah, was yeah, this sure. the, and, and the Romans were very conservative. Um, right. um, and it would have been, I would have thought even more of a problem. Right. So yeah, how are you getting I, all these senators who are Stoics and stuff? Exactly. How did that work? I think work? they did both. I think they did a little bit of both. So, for instance, uh, the Stoics used interchangeably uh, not only the word God and nature, but also Zeus. Uh, right? So that if you read a Stoic uh, trade or you went to hear a Stoic teacher, then, then it would say, oh, yeah, he's talking about Zeus. But, of course, that's not what he meant. He didn't mean the, the Olympian God. He meant... Uh, Zeus as the principle of uh, underlying the, the structure of the universe it's, and so on and so forth. So there was a little bit of uh, double talk or, or talk at two levels, let's say, right? So the, the common level and then the, the actual abstract philosophical level. Um, but yeah, a lot of them actually did get in trouble uh, for Had political uh, for problems. Their, because yeah, of this. political problems in part in part for that because of that. And also some of them. So so you mentioned that the, the Romans were in fact fairly conservative and sort of pious. In fact, Marcus Aurelius is another one. He was clearly a religious man, um, but at the same time, uh, in the meditations, you go, he goes several times, he, he actually asked himself, well, maybe there is God and maybe there is just atoms, you know, maybe there is uh, reason and maybe there is just chaos. And then he says, it doesn't matter, you still have to, you know, practice your philosophy of uh, well-being toward the rest of humanity, and you still have to be a nice person, and so on and so forth. So they actually were kind of, they were struggling themselves with this idea that they, they say in several places that essentially, the way we would put it today, their metaphysics uh, sort of underdetermined their ethics. And so it's like, okay, maybe it's one way, maybe it's the other way, but you still have to act. In so they actually flirted with materialism, sort of of the sort of like, the, I mean, the Epicureans were openly materialistic and I mean, Lucretius wrote this famous, I mean, they were atomists. I mean, right. um, so the Stoics actually flirted with materialist no, the Stoics were of, the, Sto the Stoics were definitely materialists. They, they did talk about the soul and God, but they thought of them as made of matter. For the Stoics, everything was in fact made of matter. Uh, so they were materialists. The difference between the Stoics and the Epicureans in terms of metaphysics is that the Stoics, by modern standards, were essentially determinists. They, they, they believed in a sort of universal uh, uh, web of cause and effect. The, uh, the atomists, on the other hand, talked about chaos and, um, and sort of yeah. swirling in the, in yeah. the you know, atoms swirling in the void. Yeah, sort of stuff. yeah. Lucretius, that, that was the, the yeah. I wrote, yeah. That, okay, um, so let's, uh, let's now get into the book. Um, and uh, to begin with, I just want to speak in very general terms. Um, you say at the beginning of the book, and viewers will pardon me if I'm looking down, I'm not checking email. I'm, um, I've got notes that I, I didn't <laughs> feel like I could discuss this a book, a whole book in an intelligible way if I didn't make some organizing notes. So that's what I'm doing when it looks like I'm looking away. Um, so on page nine, you say, a philosophy of life is something we all need and something we all develop consciously or not. So the first thing I want to know is what exactly do you mean by a philosophy of life? And two, in what sense do we all need one and have one even if we don't openly say that we have one? Right. No, that's an excellent question. So by a philosophy of life, I mean either an explicit or an implicit uh, framework uh, that you deploy in order to make sense of the world, to act in the world, to, uh, to prioritize things that are important for you or not important for you, and so on and so forth. Now, for most people, I would think uh, that comes built, built in with a religion. You know, most, still, still today, even though religion, you know, especially organized traditional religions are, on the, on the sort of, uh, are in a little bit of a crisis, even so, the majority of people on earth get their philosophy straight from their philosophy of life, straight from their religion. If you're a Christian, you do have certain priorities. You have a certain view of the world. Same if you're a Jew or a Muslim or a Buddhist or a Taoist, you know, whatever it is that you follow. Um, Non-religious people, uh, either they explicitly endorse a different sort of framework, like, you know, a lot of, of non-religious people consider themselves secular humanists, for instance. Some of them are secular Buddhists. Some of them, of course, are stoic. Um, and, and so that covers most of the rest of what's left over. And even people that claim that they don't have or they don't follow a philosophy of life, I think they actually still do because they take uh, certain assumptions and certain 
a certain framework from the society in which they live, from the upbringing that they actually have. So even if you left a church and you then you did not in fact embrace uh, you know openly or or, or consciously as an alternative like um, secular humanism, you still are behaving and, and thinking about the world in a certain way, and that to me is a philosophy of life. Now, what I argue in the book is that. Since it's pretty much inevitable, uh, then, and in fact, I actually argue that it is useful because it does, a philosophy of life allows you to prioritize things. It saves a lot of time. It, just, it tells you that there are certain things you want to do or not do, certain things that are important or not important, and so on and so forth, right? So, and it provides you also your moral compass to some, to some extent. Uh, so, so it is useful. And so if it is useful and you're going to have it anyway, either implicitly or, or explicitly, you might as well at least occasionally reflect on it and say, well, is it really... Is this really what I want to do and, you know, the way I want to think about stuff? So, so but just to try and condense this a little bit, clearly a philosophy of life involves your most fundamental system, your most fundamental evaluations, right? Your, your, right. Uh, yeah. Um, is it more than that, though? Is it more than simply your basic valuations? Um, um, certainly in a religion, there'd be a whole lot, lot more to it than simply... Uh, a system of evaluations. Um, is there is there more to it in this also, or is it um, or is it basically that it's a evaluation set, set of evaluations? Well, it, it is a set of evaluations, but I think it is a uh, these are evaluations at different levels, right? So there's there's the, the big picture. You know, what what do I think? How do I think about the world? What, how did it came about? What is my place in it? That sort of stuff. But also there is a lot of very practical, very day-to-day -day evaluations, right? So why is it that certain things are important to me? I don't know, family and friends, let's say. Um, why is it that I want to choose one career over another? Why, how, do I, how do I make uh, ethical choices? Why, do, why am I a vegetarian as opposed to something else? Uh, and so on and so forth. All of those things uh, tend to be informed uh, either again consciously or unconsciously by some kind of basic set of values that right. and that is what I call the philosophy of life so you 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 actually explicitly evoked and invoke in the book um, socrates's uh, 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 instruction that we that we should live the examined life uh, that the unexamined right. life is not worth living um, by which Socrates I thought always took to mean that one should always live live with at least a part of your mind operating in a critical in a critical vein, right? Um, but now let me ask you. Then now, now let me get to one of these things where I'm going to push you a little bit. So, um, there's two ways you could view this, right? So one way is a sort of a top down way. So you adopt a framework um, for whatever reason, and it, then it, then it provides a kind of a set of instructions that you follow. Right. Um, the other way is sort of a bottom up. It's sort of uh, you know, we, we've, we've evoked this distinction before, the distinction between knowing how and knowing that. So the, the second way might be a more way of a knowing how sort of way, and that is, you know, you, you, you behave, it, your valuations are implicit in your behaviors, and they're, the way they change is through a kind of a bootstrapping process where, you know, periodically you engage in this critical examination and you reevaluate. Right. Re so let me ask you uh, just to sort of why... It seems unlikely that any system is going to have a completely correct picture of uh, the way the world is and our place in it, given how complex the world is and how right. complex we are. So why adopt a top-down system um, why, why, rather than uh, simply doing it in the bootstrappy way that I described, second, which I guess is just where it's implicit? Right. So that's an excellent question. Just a couple of answers there. First of all, I think of a philosophy of life as always being in reflective equilibrium, let's say. You better need to say what that means. Yeah. That, so yeah. reflective equilibrium is this idea that it's most often associated with John Rawls mm -hmm. uh, and his theory of justice, although okay. actually the concept is a little older in philosophy. It actually comes out, comes out of philosophy of science, believe it or not. Explain um, it. Yeah, but so the basic idea is a reflective equilibrium is this idea that you have a set of beliefs or a set of sort of opinions and, and notions about, about the world or a chunk of the world, let's say ethics in particular. And, and these beliefs are always going to be in tension with each other. There's always going to be, uh, you know, uh, either beliefs that are, that are not directly congruent so that if you do one thing, then you have to compromise on something else. Or there is going to be stuff that, as you were saying, that happens to you in, in life and you have to make decisions that may not actually be congruent with sort of necessarily with your general picture. So uh, 
adopting an approach of reflective equilibrium means that you are in fact constantly sort of revising your web of beliefs uh, and you're trying to minimize these tensions essentially, right? So every time you come up with something that is, uh, that there is a clear tension between some of your principles and some of your practices. You say, well, okay, wh why, why is this happening and how is it that I can sort of harmonize, if not resolve, because life is too complicated for resolving every conflict, but at least sort of harmonizing as little as, as much as possible. Uh, so in, in, in one sense, I do think of a philosophy of life as an evolving uh, uh, notion that is uh, uh, sort of regulated in, in, in this way as through, through a, um, uh, reflective equilibrium. But the other thing is, um, because we're talking about, precisely because we're talking about philosophy and not re a religion, it's actually going to be much easier to do that sort of stuff. Because as I was saying earlier, it's not a, just because Epictetus said X, then I have to believe X or I have to do X. I can be in constant tension and constant dialogue with, with the Stoics. Now, your question, uh, the second part of your question is, you know, about why adopt a general system, uh, you know, sort of a top-down, as you put it, system. Um, it's not that you necessarily adopt it and then you leave it there, right? Uh, it's, it's a general framework, but as I said, it is actually itself open to revision and to modification. Do you modification. think that people need big picture things? I mean, I almost was going to answer myself by saying this <laughs> partly does reflect somewhat of a human need in terms of the way that humans look at things. That's right. that we, we need big picture kind of. Yes. Not all so. of us are very good at. Right. habituating in a bootstrappy kind of way without a big idea. That's right. Think that I think that's right. And also, again, a big idea, so a big picture actually simplifies your life significantly. Uh, this is true, again, also for religions. I mean, religion is, yeah. is the, the obvious example of a yeah. top-down system, yeah. right? Um, but, you know, it simplifies things because if you're a Christian, there are certain things you're simply not going to do. And there are certain other things you're going to do by default. Uh, and that simplifies your life. Again, the, the, the event, I think the, the right approach there is to consider that a dynamic system and not a fixed one. But, um, but generally speaking, yes, I think we do work better. We have a, ten a natural tendency to sort of have wanting to have some level of, of, of a big picture in mind. The other thing that I want to add about this particular topic is that I don't claim uh, that stoicism is the right picture. I'm going to get to uh, that next. <laughs> right, right. So I actually think it's one of a number of possible philosophies of life. There are others that are just as good and they actually may fit better some people you know uh and what is, is the same way in which stoicism may fit better certain kinds of personalities or certain kinds of 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 culture because you know the, one of the things the stoicism is, is very close in some respects to buddhism and yet when i tried to study buddhism it felt really alien the the language used the metaphors used so the the somewhat mystical references just didn't click with me at all yeah. When I, as soon as I started reading uh, Stoic texts, I said, oh, yeah, that's right. Um, and yet, a lot of the truths or a lot of the, the, the notions, a lot of the, the, the uh, precepts that you find in Stoicism are really very close to the ones you find in Buddhism. It's just that, culturally speaking, Stoicism spoke to me and Buddhism didn't. Yeah. It's also one of the sources of Christianity. It is. That's right. Christianity um, absorbed a lot of it. That's why... Stoicism feels a lot, uh, you know, familiar to the to the Western mind because Christianity absorbed a lot of notions from Stoicism. Yeah, yeah. So let me ask you a minute just about this, ecu this sort of ecumenicalism that you sort of embrace, because this is also you're very explicit at the beginning of the book. Um, uh, on page two, you 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 explicitly express a kind of an ecumenical attitude towards these philosophies of life. On page twelve, you speak about Stoicism's flexibility. Um, I, I only found, it's not so much incongruous, but it's something that I wanted more explanation for you from. You spend a lot of time in the book saying why you think Stoicism gets so many things right. Right. <laughs> now, it's unlikely <laughs> that all these philosophies of life that are available are going to get the same things right. And in some ways, they're going to be uh, sort of categorically um, uh, uh, incommensurable, it seems to me. Um, and so... How, on the one hand, can you believe that Stoicism gets so much of it right, and at the same time be so ecumenical? And now, obviously, practically, you have to be ecumenical because it's not like right. people are going to stop being Christians for you, right? <laughs> but I'm just curious, in terms of your own mind, how you think of uh, the the rightness of Stoicism on the one hand, with the ecumenicalism that you seem very committed to, on right. the other hand. 
So yeah, that's an excellent question. So the way I think of it is that there are some basic fundamental ideas within Stoicism that you find expressed differently perhaps, but you do find in a number of other traditions, not just in Buddhism, as I said, or in Christianity in part because it absorbed them from Stoicism directly, but also in other uh, you know, Eastern philosophies like Confucianism or, or, or Taoism especially. Um, and in fact, there is a chapter in the book where I talk about the fact that the concept of virtue, uh, since Stoicism is, is, of course, a type of virtue ethics, the concept of virtue is actually essentially uh, has been empirically demonstrated to be universal across human cultures, at least across complex human culture, literate uh, human cultures. And moreover, when comparative psychologists have actually looked into it, it turns out that uh, pretty much every culture recognizes a small number of fundamental virtues and there is a lot of overlap. They're not identical uh, between different traditions, but there is a lot of overlap. The, the four fundamental Stoic virtues are actually basically universal. They're found everywhere. Uh, there are two more virtues that are found everywhere, and those also are found in Stoicism, except the Stoics don't call them virtues. They, they, they categorize them differently. So there seems to be, empirically speaking, a lot of overlap between different traditions. Now, of course, the way you express these notions varies culturally and with and, and, and in time. Uh, the priorities perhaps vary uh, significantly from, from one uh, philosophy to another. So for the Stoics, you know, certain things are important, are more important than others. And for a Christian, certain other things are more important than others, right? Uh, so there is a significant amount of variation. But ultimately, I feel that as a Stoic, uh, when it comes to the important part of Stoicism, which is ethics, the ethics, uh, I can talk to a Christian or to a Buddhist or to a Taoist, and they'll understand what I'm talking about. Uh, we might have some disagreements about priorities or the way in which we express them, but I think they will understand and attend. So the way, so the reason I defend, so to speak, Stoicism in the book is uh, is the reason I do it is is twofold. On the one end, I think it's underappreciated. Stoicism really could be the Western response to Buddhism, and there's no reason in my mind why at least people that are that, that are uh, they grew up in the, within the Western tradition, shouldn't be taking a, uh, you know, a, a more serious look at, at Stoicism uh, a, as a possible philosophy of life. But also, uh, in, the, in the end, that uh, you can be metaphysically ecumenical. And one of the things that, I, you know, in the chapter about God, for instance, I say that the concept of the logos, which for the, for the Stoics, you know, meant this, this rational principle that is underlying the structure of the universe and which is present, literally physically present inside us, right? So the, 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 uh, we, we are, in fact, one of the best expressions of the logos because we're capable of reason, right? We're capable of, of yeah. articulating yeah. why we think certain things. Well, you can look at the concept of logos, which is a metaphysical concept. And if you are a, a, a pantheist, like the Stoics were, you could say, oh, yeah, the logos is... Uh, the, the universe uh, or the, the fact that God is immanent in the universe and God is the universe. If you're a Christian, you can say, well, Logos is the word of God. Is, is and the they God. did say that. I mean, that's, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's in the Greek. Yeah, absolutely. yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you're an atheist, you can say, like Einstein famously said, you know, I believe in the laws of nature and the laws of nature are organized rationally. And if they weren't, we couldn't do science. That's probably closest to your way of thinking about it, right? Yes, that last that's definitely way. my way of thinking yeah. about it. Now, you could say, where, where those laws of, of rationality, you know, why is it that the universe is organized that way? We don't know. We really don't know. Yeah. Uh, you know, if, 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 a, a, a Christian would give you a very different answer from an atheist from that perspective, but I don't really care. The, to me, the, the observation is they yeah. are, the universe is organized in a certain way. We do have, as human beings, a certain nature and certain capacities. Let's use them. You know, as you're talking, and you're talking about the how you how you see the combination of the defense, the apologia for Stoicism with the ecumenicalism, I have to say that I mean, you remind me a lot of uh, Giovanni Pico della Mirandola, um, <laughs> um, um, who also argued, uh, if you read the oration on the dignity of man, that all the religions have a common that's have right. a common. Uh, and he was an ecumenicalist at a, t a very early day, and and. Um, people, I think it's easy to forget because of the current noise, but humanism was not secular. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. Uh, humanism exactly. in the Renaissance was not secular. In a lot of ways, it seems to me like you're, you're in a sense reaching back to an early modern way of thinking about, um, yeah. about philosophies of life and the relationship of the different religions to one another and a sort of a brotherhood, a broad brotherhood of, of man, as Pico would describe it. 
Um, uh, you could have had a conversation with him in this book, and I think it would have come out very similar. Um, that's right. That's right. So that was the period during which the so-called neo-Stoics were were active, and uh, the neo-Stoics, which included uh, Michel de Montaigne, for instance, yeah, uh, they were explicitly trying to reconcile the the Greek Roman Stoicism with Christianity, and and yes, they were definitely ecumenical in that sense. And have and you absorbed the, any of that? Any of the Renaissance? I mean, given that you are as yours is a modern version. Does the Renaissance, do the Renaissance humanists prov um, provide any uh, sort of bridge between the ancient and the practice of it today? Or is it really, you go straight back to the original sources and try to... I personally go back to this, to the, mostly to the ancient sources, but I am interested in the Renaissance project precisely because I, uh, you're right, I do see it as very similar to my own, except of course another four or 500 years have passed, so science and philosophy have moved further uh, than at the time of Montaigne or, or the humanists. But, you know, it's not, a, it's not by chance that the Stoics influenced also uh, key philosophical figures like Rene Descartes or, or Baruch Spinoza. So, yeah, um, yeah, you know, there yeah. are reasons for that. So. Great stuff. Okay, so let's talk about the book's actual structure. Um, uh, the way I'm breaking it down isn't quite by chapter, but more what seems to me like the logical structure. <laughs> yeah, that will structure. take us the rest of the day. <laughs> yeah, like the logical structure of the book. It seems like there's three main sections where you address three questions. The first is what should we want? The second is how should we act? And the third is how we should react. Right. And then I would describe as supplementary two sections, one in which contains practical and spiritual exercises, which people who have watched the electric, who, have the electric, who watched um, Sophia before, um, well, no, in our dialogue, we had a dialogue where you went to some pretty good detail on your practices, and those are, those are many of those are, are in the book. And then you have a, a second supplementary section on the Hellenistic uh, schools of practical philosophy. I thought that, first of all, is that a fair characterization of the logical structure of the book? Yes, that's right. Okay. The only thing that it's, that it's uh, in addition to that, is that it, the book begins with a sort of a setting out the Yeah, the introductory material. Context. Yeah, right. yeah. Um, so what I thought maybe you would do is maybe you would give me, or give the audience, the, the core big idea within each of the three main sections. So what's the core idea and what should we want that you're trying to get across? What's the core idea and how should we act that you're trying to get across? And what's the core idea and how should we react? Right. Uh, and maybe you can also throw in, why separate how you should act and how you should react? I found that interesting also. Why give separate treatments of those two things? Yeah. So the, you're, you're, the, the, you're right, the, the central section, the largest part of the book is organized along these, those three uh, key ideas. It's not at all by chance. Those are the three disciplines identified by Epictetus uh, in the discourses. He explicitly talks about the, these three. And those are known as the discipline of desire, the discipline of action, and, and uh, the, the discipline of assent. Uh, that's the third one. They are related. They're, they actually represent, there's a diagram in the book that explains this, uh, I think, fairly nicely and fairly clearly. Uh, these three disciplines are related to the four virtues and also to the uh, so-called the, the three topoi, that is the three areas of inquiry. Uh, so the four virtues choice. are wisdom, courage, justice, and temperance, right? Yes. The first one is actually practical wisdom. So what used to be called prudence uh, at some point, which is, so let's talk about that for a second, then I'll connect them to the discipline. So uh, the four virtues are practical wisdom or phronesis in, in Greek uh, or prudence. And that is the ability to navigate complex situations in the best possible that is, uh, way uh, that is, that is available. Um, the second way is, is courage, uh, which is not just physical, but also sort of moral courage, you know, the courage to do the right thing or to stand up for the right thing. Um, temperance, of course, is self-control, is the idea that you do things in, in, in the measure that is appropriate to do it. And then justice means that you treat other people with fairness uh, as fellow human beings and also that you have an interest for the benefit of mankind uh, that is the stoics were in fact the first uh, among the first together with the cynics um, uh, cosmopolitans they they explicitly said that you know we're all brothers and sisters they actually refer to each other as brothers and sisters is it significant that they leave out the one that's central both to Plato and Aristotle, and that is uh, theoretical reason or contemplation? Yes. Is there is. some significance in that? Could you explain why, what, what's significant about that? I think it is. So the Stoics uh, insisted that, that theirs was a practical philosophy. If you, the, the most important part of it was the, the ethics, how you actually live your life. 
Epictetus says several times, if you just studied the theory and you go out of this lecture room and that's it, you have absolutely wasted your time. <laughs> yeah. And so they were kind of skeptical. In fact, there are several passages in both Epictetus and Seneca where they say things like, so you can, you can, you can tell me uh, the structure of syllogism according to Chrysippus. Now what? What are you going to do with that? Are you a if, jerk or are you a nice guy? Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's what really matters, right? So, so if, knowing the struct, if knowing logic helps you being a better person, great. Otherwise, you're just wasting your time. You're just being logic, doing logic chopping. That brings me to the three topoi. So the three topoi, um, the, the, the areas of inquiry, the areas of study, uh, if you were practicing, uh, if you were studying stoicism as in, in a school, let's say, you would study three things. The physics, uh, which uh, included really all the natural sciences and metaphysics. That gives you an idea of how the world works in, in general. Then you will study also logic, by which they meant not just uh, the formal study of reasonings or logical fallacies and things like that, you know, the syllogism. They, were, they, they actually expanded greatly, the Stoics expanded greatly on, on uh, Aristotle's uh, treatment of syllogisms. Uh, but uh, e uh, epistemology, so they developed the theory of knowledge and cognitive, what we would today call cognitive science, that is an understanding of how the human mind works or fails to work. Um, why you want to do that? Because you want to learn to reason well. And then the idea was that uh, ethics, the third topos, is the crucial one, is that's the one that t tells you how to live your life. But in order to do that, you have to know something about how the universe works and you have to reason correctly, essentially. That's the idea. Now, let's connect all of this. So how does that connect to the three questions that you yeah. ask about what should we want, how should we act, and how should we react? Right. So the first discipline is the discipline of desire, which tells you, as you say, uh, what should, we should want or not want. Now that is informed by the topos of physics, because physics tells you how the universe works. And if you want things that are not possible, then you're just wasting your time, so in, in, in that sense. You need to know how the world actually works. You have a good understanding of how the, the world works, because there's going to be some things that are simply not accessible to you. And if you keep desiring them, uh, or if you keep making efforts to get stuff that it's really not, uh, not up to you to get, then you're just wasting a lot of energy and a lot of, a lot of, a lot of um, effort. That one is therefore connected, you know, the discipline of, of uh, desire um, is therefore connected with the, the virtue of courage and with the virtue, it's the only one that's connected to two virtues, courage and temperance. Why is that? Because temperance should be obvious, right? So if we're talking about desire, uh, then controlling your desires, your temperance is, is the, obvious, uh, the obvious virtue. The virtue of courage is, I think, always struck me as interesting. You know, why connect courage? to desire because it actually according to the stoics takes courage it takes guts to see to look at the world the way it actually is and not the way you wish it to be right um so the discipline of desire really tells you uh what is it that it's sensible for you to want and spend your life trying to achieve as opposed to what it's not sensible to want and therefore you should probably avoid or or, or consider as as not important um, so that's the basic idea about the desire. Okay, so you know, desire. don't don't go on to the next one. Yeah. I want to ask you about desire sure. um, because this just occurred to me. Um, there's two ways you could mean the should and what should you want right. or what should you desire. One way is the way that you seem to be describing, and that is your desires should be constrained within that which is actually po attainable, that which is possible, that which. Correct. Um, but there's another sense, um, you know. Uh, 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 my neighborhood, my neighbor's attractive daughter may be attainable, yeah. may be attainable, right. Huh? right? But there's another sense of should in which I shouldn't want her, right? Right. So, do the Stoics also have that? Let's call that second sense the the purely the moral sense, right? Right. Do they have that sense of what you should want, and where does that come from? If not, because it's very clear where the conception of attainability comes from. That right. comes from looking at the world, right? Right. Where does the, what informs the second? Now, you're gonna, I think you're going to be surprised by the answer. Yes, they do have it, but it comes from the third discipline. Oh, okay, so I'm just jumping the gun. You're just jumping the gun. Okay, so go ahead then. An, I don't but it's an interesting way because it, it is actually a good question. There's that second sense, but their second sense, it comes from the, dif the discipline of ascent. 
Uh, and okay. so we'll get there in a, in a okay, minute. Okay, great, great. This particular example of your, you know, your neighbor's wife. Right, right, actually, right, right. Epictetus actually talks explicitly about that particular example. Okay, great, 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 great. So the second discipline is the one of action. Uh, the discipline of action is connected to uh, the virtue of justice, uh, right? And and it is connected to the um, sort of the topos of ethics. Um, so justice, as I said, for the Stoics, that they didn't really have a sort of an overarching theory of justice like John Rawls, let's say today, right? Or or uh, or a similar thing. Or even, they, Pla or even Plato. Or even Plato. What yeah. they meant by justice was simply, was at a, at a, uh, a very nitty gritty personal level. They say, you know, justice means to treat other people as fellow human beings. The only overarching idea that sort of the, the underpinning that, that notion was the cosmopolitanism, was the idea that we are member of the same, we're on the same boat to, together. And that literally, they, they literally thought that Whenever you benefit others, you benefit yourself because we're all, we're a social animal and social animals are interdependent. They, they, we depend on each other. So if I, let's say, uh, am, am helping, uh, I don't know, pay taxes so that uh, education in, uh, uh, is available to more people, well, that benefits me directly because it builds yeah. a better society and therefore uh, I benefit. It's not, it's not, they didn't really recognize this sharp distinction that we uh, recognize today between sort of selfish motives and altruistic motives. Since we're all connected, they're the same thing. They collapse into the same. Everything thing. we do reverberates around the human exactly. community. And so, yeah, exactly. I, I see that. Yeah. So there's yeah. no sharp distinction between the two, right? Um, so the discipline of action is really the one that tells you, you should be um, using reason uh, to improve social living. Now, that's the basic idea. In fact, the Stoics had a, had a famous phrase to encapsulate uh, this idea, and they said that they, we should live according to nature. Living according to nature doesn't mean, you know, going naked into the forest and hugging trees. Uh, it means living according to human nature, and human nature, according, for the Stoics, is primarily the result of, you know, describing two in two uh, ways. One, we are an animal capable of reason. And two, we are a social animal. So, so they agree with Aristotle that man, man is for the political life. That's right. Yeah. In that yeah, sense, yes, yeah. there was no distinction. The polis no is, not, is, is part of our telos. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes. We're, we're rational and anim, social animals. So what we need to do in life is to, to uh, use reason to improve social living. So that's the second uh, discipline. So that one actually informs most of their ethics you know, uh, um, in terms of interaction with, with, with other people. Uh, and as I said, the cosmopolitanism is under, underlying that, uh, that notion. So l literally, as I mentioned a minute ago, this, the Stoics went around referring to other people, to strangers, as brothers and sisters. Um, and they, they thought uh, Hierocles, who was a late Roman Stoic, um, actually had this idea of the concentric circles of, of concern yeah, uh, yeah. that you know, start out with you. But then there's your family, and then your friends, and then your fellow there's citizens. There's a diagram in the book of that as well. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and yeah. the idea was so today uh, the, that notion comes out of most of the people like Peter Singer and talks about. Yeah, the utilitarians people. have adopted that as right. kind of a and way of thinking Singer, about. Yeah. Right. So Singer talks about expanding circles of concern, right? The Stoics are kind of almost sort of reverse it. They actually talked about. Con uh, uh, shrinking or, or pulling in the, the circles of concern. You want to pull other people as close as possible to you. They call this okayosis. Okayosis means becoming familiar with. So becoming familiar with strangers means that you treat them as family. And then you treat your family as, if you're, if, as you want it to be treated. So. Now, the third discipline um, is the, um, the discipline of assent. That one is connected to the um, topos of logic. So it depends on reasoning, on sound reasoning. Um, and um, and um, uh, it basically means that there are, you're, you're constantly bombarded by uh, impressions, what the, what, what the Stoics called impressions. Let's use your example earlier. So I uh, see my neighbor's wife who is uh, very attractive and I have the impression, meaning that my first reactions or my natural uh, thinking is, Oh, it wouldn't be good to you know get get in bed with her because she's so attractive. Now the Stoic said, "Yeah, sure, that's a natural impression, but you ought to use your reason and inquire into that impression and say, but yes, but 
is this really a good thing to do? Is it really something that I should be doing? And they would say, no, it isn't. Therefore, put on it what your ground? Mind. On what grounds? See, I understand the grounds for the first kind of should. Right. Because the, con the notion of what is attainable and, and realistic, given the fact, I, it's very straightforward how I could know that based on my knowledge of the world, right? Right. What is that second? What grounds that second should? I think it is. So the three I'm wondering if they have the same problem Kant does, sort of that that second should is much harder to ground, right? I right. Mean, um, so the answer to that is that the, although I treat the three disciplines separately, um, for convenience, because you can't do it otherwise. Epictetus directly says that they're connected to each other and they reinforce each other. So mm. really the should comes out of the fact that if you go, if you do act on that impression, if you don't deny assent, as the Stoics would say, to that impression, then you're doing something that is unjust mm. uh, in, with respect to your neighbor, right? So would you like to be, you know, your wife to be uh, doing the same with, with your neighbor? Probably not. And so in that sense, you are actually treating, you know, you, you're, you're acting in a way that doesn't treat your neighbor with, you know, in a just and fair and fair manner. Okay. Okay. So, so, so the, the four virtues, which give way to the three topoi, which give way to your three questions, it can be a little misleading. The three questions are not one for one matches to the three topoi. They all no. sort of work together. That's right. By the um, way, I, I neglected to mention that the fourth virtue is connected to uh, the discipline of ascent, and that is the, the, the virtue of phronesis, or practical wisdom. Yeah. So basically that one is the one that tells you, well, is it really a good idea to do this or that? What, which course of action should I take? Right. And that is it a really good idea, that practical reason will draw both from facts, which yep. will give me things like attainability right and That's the right. first should but it will also take into consideration matters of justice yes. which will give me the second should is that sort of that's right that's right that's right that's okay right. that's really interesting and um, the, the, the discipline of ascent is crucial because we're constantly bombarded by these impressions right we always have this idea that oh getting more money is a good thing let's say uh okay that's an impression now i want to investigate that impression uh and the answer is well it depends on how i get my money if I get my money in a way that is that doesn't violate the principles of the principle of justice, then I'm fine. Uh, the Stoics were definitely not; they were not cynics. They were not uh, endorsing it as a minimalist lifestyle. Uh, Seneca was one of the most uh, influential and rich uh, men in in the Roman world. Yeah. Uh, but you have to do it in a certain way. If you don't do it in that way, then you really are ought not to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's great, and and I and and and. It does explain to me something that I really wasn't clear on, and and, and uh, uh, with regard to the the two shoulds. Um, so let's now let's now go beyond the the the. Th Actually, one last thing about the so the distinction between how you should act and how you should react. Do the do the Stoics have have? And this is going to come up as something I'm going to ask you later. Um, do the Stoics have a sort of a notion that, that we're kind of besieged constantly? Is there a sense of sort of, yeah. you know what I'm saying? In other, in other yeah. words, is there a bit of a, a, bit of a, a not a cloistered mentality, but a bit of a sort of, you know, the world in many ways attacks us. And so uh -huh. we, we, we shouldn't just talk about how we act. We have to carve off a whole separate account of reaction because so much is. Yeah. And where else do we find something like that? We find it in Christianity, right? Christians are always worried about temptations and you're falling right. into temptation, right? That's right. Now, of course, that's why you get a monastic. Is there a Stoic equivalent to the monastic tradition? No, nope, that's the cynics. <laughs> so the right, cynics, right, are, right, a different, a different kind of sort of philosophy that did influence, especially early Stoicism. The Stoics were admiring of the cynics. Aren't they an offshoot of the cynics? They Gene are, in genealogically, that, wasn't Zeno a student yeah. of a cynic? That's right. Yeah, That's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was a student of a cynic, and uh, in in a sense, the Stoicism really is a middle way philosophy between uh, cynicism on the one hand and Aristotelianism on the other hand. The cynics preached uh, that virtue is not is the only thing that is important, and everything else literally gets in your way. So that's why you get these famous stories of minimalists living in, uh, among the cynics like Diogenes of uh, Sinope who was living in a bathtub or things like that, right? At the opposite extreme, you get the Aristotelians who said that, yes, virtue is fundamental, 
but unless you have other things like a little bit of education, a little bit of wealth, a little bit of health, a little bit of you know good looking, uh, your life is not going to be that 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 good, not that you demonic. The Stoics kind of found a middle way between these two. They said, no, the only thing you need for the eudaimonic life, for a life uh, worth living, is virtue, regardless of external circumstances. But uh, unless it compromises virtue, external circumstance, some external circumstances are preferable. So it's okay to, unlike the cynics, to, to go uh, and become you know, wealthy or, or, or work on your health or, or your education or anything like that, uh, so long as you don't do it in a way that compromises your moral character, your moral integrity. Right, right. right. So the, for the cynics, what the Stoics would call the preferred indifference that's right. Are always interfering with the pursuit yes. of virtue, whereas for the Stoics, so long as they're not in interfering with the pursuit of virtue, they're perfectly fine and obviously That's desirable right. for all sorts That's of right. reasons. And in fact, the, the relationship between the two schools was very peculiar um, because the Stoics uh, did engage in discussions, you know, in these controversies with the academic skeptics, with the Platonists. Uh, with the Epicureans especially, but never with the cynics. The cynics were always praised by the Stoics, right? In fact, Epictetus at some point says, you know, you're, you probably should be, if you're up to it, you should be a cynic. But if you can't, then at least be a Stoic. Yeah. So it's like, you know, and I, the, the way I think of it, that's not the way they thought of it for certain. So I, I want to draw a distinction here. But the way I think of it, it is, is very similar to the distinction between, let's say, a Christian monk and an a everyday Christian or a Buddhist monk and an everyday Buddhist, right? So the everyday Buddhist doesn't rise to the level of the, Christian, the Buddhist monk. It's not, you know, it doesn't give up um, all of the externals. It doesn't do that sort of stuff, but it's a Buddhist. It's a, it's a, it's a good, you know, it's supposed, you're supposed to be a good Buddhist. And then if you, if you get the calling, then you, then you become a monk. Uh, I think that Epictetus really saw that very similar. In fact, he says in the, in the discourses that uh, only people who get the call become cynic. Yeah. And, and so let me ask you that you brought this up in the, in the dialogue with Sky Cleary when I pushed you a little bit. Um, not everyone is this, not, no one can actually be the sage for right. the Stoic. But is the cynic in a sense the sage, the it's Stoic close. sage? Yeah, it gets okay. close. Okay, so, so, and this is something that I am going to, I think I'm going to resist a little, um, or maybe a lot. Um, um, so the Stoic really does take as an ideal the not caring about the preferred indifference. It's almost a concession to allow the preferred indifference, it sounds like. Well, that varies from Stoic to Stoic. Uh, so Seneca is much less so, and, and Epictetus is, is by far the one that gets closer to the, to the cynic. Um, what about you? So, so you I chose Epictetus, but do you, are you, do you really well, think that the that idea, part. you no, reject, reject that part. That part. Yes, I reject that part. I say that, no, I don't think it's actually a good idea for a human being uh, to go the cynic way. I mean, if, if, you know, if that's your personality, by all means, go ahead, right? Um, but no, I don't think that it's a sustainable uh, lifestyle for most human beings. It's just not natural for most human beings. Most human beings do want a certain number of things like a house or you know, a job and you know, some, some... And not things. having them will interfere with their virtue. That... All right, Massimo, we're back. We did have a technical glitch. Uh, Time Warner uh, is not doing good things for you. Um, you mean Spectrum, Spectrum. right? Spectrum, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Yeah. Some shack somewhere it, with, with a radio aerial coming out of the top of it. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, so I was pushing you a little bit on this, on this um, notion of, of, of whether, uh, whether we should care about or desire these these preferred indifference that don't uh, that don't affect your virtue that don't have an effect in your virtue and 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 there's the stoical idea of the sage as the, the sort of the ideal person right. and at least in one version of it you said that the stoical sage I guess this is Epictetus's version uh, ideally doesn't care about any preferred indifference about things right. that 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 are nice but don't don't affect your virtue right. um, and I sort of asked you whether whether you think that that's an ideal because it seems to me uh, you would sort of have to in order to use the sage as an explanation right. of why most people don't are you know are not able to do without right. preferred indifference. 
Right. Now, you said that you don't accept that ideal. No, uh, that's, that's one of the things that I think uh, uh, can change or can be updated or, or, or altered between ancient Stoicism and modern Stoicism. Um, I think that Epictetus was wrong, and I think this, the Stoics more broadly, in thinking of the sage as the ideal human being. I think that human being, you know, we need to take seriously what human nature really is, which is that, that one is a Stoic principle, right? You, you live according to nature. Well, let's look at what human nature is. Human, human beings do naturally prefer to have certain, uh, you know, out, uh, in, so-called indifferent, you know, certain, certain uh, externals. Certain and external do, goods. It's certain external goods, correct. whether relationships right. or commodities or… Correct, correct. So I think that a, a reasonable way to reinterpret or modernize, however, however you want to put it, the Stoic doctrine is that uh, the externals are preferred or, di or dispreferred indifference in the, se in the sense that you should go after them or avoid them, depending on which category you're talking about, so long as they don't uh, get in the way of your sort of moral integrity. In other words, if you have to, if you have to compromise your moral character in order to get money, let's say, or to get better health or something like that, then, then you shouldn't do it. I, I, I do really believe that that is a sound uh, principle. Yeah. Uh, but... But even Aristotle would agree with that, right? I mean... Yes. Um, 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 yes. I guess what I'm asking is whether your version of Stoicism is even more of an in-between with Aristotle. In other words, you make more concession to... It sounds to me like you're saying virtue is not entirely self-sufficient in a, in a normal person, right? Because, because there, are go there is going to be a level, and I've pressed you on this before, there's going to be a level of poverty, deprivation, um, right. um, um, isolation or loneliness that are going to seriously challenge a person's capacity Right. Uh, to flesh. Now, I mean, you can point to sort of, you know, sort of supremely uh, impressive examples. I know you talk about James Stockdale sitting in the Hanoi Hilton and that stoicism right. helped him um, um, and all of that. But I'm wondering whether, in a sense, yours is almost like, in some ways, a hybrid stoicism slash Aristotelianism and that you don't hold the sage as an ideal. It's a good question. Uh, while the latter is true, I don't, I don't actually hold the sage as an idea. I don't think it is any move close, closer to uh, Aristotelianism, and here's why. Because the relationship between the, the externals and virtue in the Stoics is complicated. So Aristotle uh, will tell you that you do need some externals because otherwise you're not going to have a good life. By good, of course, he meant eudaimonic life, not yeah, good in yeah, the modern yeah, sense of the yeah. term, right? Uh, so a life worth living. Now, I stick, I stick with, the, with the Stoics in that respect, that a life where you do the right thing, where you're helpful to society as much as it is possible for you to do so, uh, you're helpful to your friends and your family, is a life worth living, regardless of external circumstances. Not only that, some, external circum some positive external circumstances might actually get in the way of doing that, and some negative external circumstances might be helpful. So we all know, uh, examples of people who are rich and are assholes, right? Yeah, yeah. They get that, that, that wealth is in fact, uh, you know, as, as a potential to get in the way of, of, uh, of your virtue. And we also all know examples of people who are poor or not particularly educated, and yet they are morally far better uh, characters than, than people who are educated or wealthy. So that one, I agree with the Stoics, that the relationship between the externals and virtue is complicated. It's not as easy as Aristotle basically puts it, that, well, if you're educated and, and wealthy and all that, you're going to be better off. Not necessarily. Actually, that, that, that stuff can actually get in your way, but it doesn't have to get in the way. So there's nothing intrinsic in health, wealth, and education that makes it more challenging for you to, to, to be a, a moral person. Uh, it's just that it, for some people it's that way, and for some people it isn't that way. The reason I reject, however, the sage is because mm. the, ideal, the ideal stoic, the ideal uh, sage, is somebody who is at, has actually been able to transcend entirely the preferred and dispreferred indifference. Basically, he's become a cynic, right? And as I said earlier, I don't think that cynicism is actually a, a, a sustainable uh, philosophy for most human beings. If it works for some people, good for them. But I don't think it is a generalizable philosophy. And what I'm interested in is a generalizable philosophy, something that actually applies to the majority, at least potentially, yeah. to the majority of human beings. Yeah, yeah. So the, the last thing on this, and, 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 and if the audience hasn't watched the dialogue with Sky Cleary, obviously I, I suggest you do. Towards the end of it, I, I 
probably was the only time I really pushed you at all. And I tried to push actually pretty hard. And I, and I forget about preferred um, uh, indifference. And, 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 um, let's go in the opposite direction. I mean, I, I submitted to you that there is a, de a level of deprivation of goods, of external goods, that not only can make it impossible to flourish, but can make it impossible to even retain your humanity. Um, and I sort of gave the example of Primo Levi's survival in Auschwitz and the description of the way that right. Jews treated each other. And your response was that the, what, the way the Stoic tries to handle that is by saying that nobody is actually a sage. Mm -hmm. um, um, and thus, normal people who aren't sages, they do to a certain, their virtue does to some extent depend on at least not being so deprived of certain right. preferred indifference that, that you're reduced to a kind of an animal status. Right. But it seems to me that that reply does rely upon holding the sage as an ideal. Now, if you don't think the sage is an ideal, how then do you yeah, uh, that's a good question. answer the challenge about at least um, fundamental basic goods, right? right. Not riches or, or... Yeah, 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 right. But freedom, so, not starving to death. I mean, that sort of thing. So that's a, that's a good, um, that's a very good question. There are, I think there are two answers. First of all, I'm going to change my original answer. Sure, uh, let's from think the on sage, our feet, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So to, from the sage to somebody like, let's say, Viktor Frankl. So you, you, you brought up uh, uh, the example of Primo Levi yeah. and, and, and how the degradation of certain conditions of human conditions can actually uh, uh, make the, the worst come out of human beings. Yes. But yeah. Viktor Frankl is an example of the opposite, right? So he was also in concentration camp. He also saw deprivation and experienced deprivation. And in fact, he kind of used that as a way, uh, used his, his internal moral strength as a way to get out of that situation yeah. uh, and survive that situation, right? So that to me means that, now he, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't consider Viktor Frankl a sage because he does care about, you know, getting better, better externals, so to speak, right? He wants to get out of, of the concentration camp. He wants to have a normal life. He wants to have, you know, what, what most people want. But at the same time, he found the moral resilience, the human spirit inside himself uh, under those very taxing conditions, and that actually, that actually, according to him, his own account in his in his book, uh, that's what got him through. Right. Just like you mentioned earlier, uh, James Stockdale, the same idea. Yeah. I mean, James Stockdale didn't like uh, to be, or wasn't indifferent to being tortured and spending, you know, seven years in in confinement and all that sort of stuff in, yeah. in Vietnam. But uh, his internal resources, his his, uh, uh, his moral strength, his strength of character, is what actually got him got him through that sort of stuff. So I think the answer, a better answer is not that we should become sages, but that we should uh, take example from exceptional individuals like Frankel or, or Stockdale or, or a number of others. Um, uh, Malala is the, another one that I actually uh, quote uh, mentioned in the book, you know, the, the young uh, girl who was shot uh, simply because she was advocating for, uh, in Pakistan, she was advocating for education of, of women. Um, those are people who don't, don't like to be, yeah. or you know, they're not indifferent in the sage sense of the term. The sage the, is almost like inhuman. But then you are forced to say to a certain extent that the people who can't take it, who crack, are some are, have failed in a way. It's hard for me to bring myself sure. to say that, but I mean, I don't see how theoretically you can avoid it, right? I mean, um, you know what I mean? When you point to these examples, and then I say to you, okay, well, what about the, the guy next door who just cracked in the Hanoi Hilton? Right. The Stoic has to, at some point, describe that as a kind of failure, right? If he's going to hold on to the theory of the sufficiency right. of virtue, the self-sufficiency right, of flourishing, right. right? I suppose so, but, but the Stoics, one of the things that I do like about the Stoics is that they really stayed away from negative uh, connotations, from, ne mm. from judgment, right? Mm. So, so Epictetus, for instance, at one, set, at one point says explicitly, he says, don't judge people. Don't, if somebody mm. uh, drinks, right, let's say, don't say he drinks too much. Just rephrase it in a neutral sense and say, he drinks a lot. Uh, you know, don't say he bathes badly. He says, he doesn't bathe a lot. So try to rephrase things in a neutral sense. Why? And say, because um, he, he explains, first of all, because you're not, you're not necessarily better than he is. Mm, and second humility. of all, you, right, so humility. And second of all, uh, also a kind of epistemic humility. You don't know him. You don't know a lot of you know, other people enough. You don't know their motivations. You don't know why they're doing these things. You don't know their history. You don't know where they're coming from with all this, right? There may be very good reasons for w doing what he's doing, and you should just simply treat it as a human being and say, okay, 
Is he trying to be to do something? Can I be helpful? That's it. So I wouldn't say that the people that didn't survive, you know, like Victor Flankel or James Stockdale, failed in a in a in sort of morally negative sense. They just did not have enough resources to get through. Right. That, that and the situation. ideal would be not to crack. I mean, that's the sort of that's the notion. Right. The yeah. ideal's not. Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. I mean, right. But yeah, it's not that yeah. if you if you fail, it's it's a moral failure. It's like. Ideally, you should be able to, you, you want to get through this thing and stoicism or similar philosophies give you some resources to try to do that. And if you can't do it, well, you know, we're all human beings. Okay, so let's, let's discuss one last, I mean, we're going on quite a bit. So let's, let's, yes. let's discuss one last thing that I wanted to get to and where there's also some stuff I want to push you on a little bit. Um, there seems to me to be, you know, you could never reduce something this complex with this much history behind it to a sort of simple formula. But there does seem to me to be one big idea that le that governs a lot of the stuff you've been talking about, and that's this idea about uh, the things you can change and the things you can't. Right, right. the dichotomy of control. Right. So this strikes me as being foundational. If anything, if there's any one foundational idea that you could see where it it's influence in all these different parts of things you're talking about, that's right. it's in this. Um, could you say a little bit about, talk a little bit about that principle and what you see as its foundational roles with respect to all the things we've been talking about? I think mean, you're right. It is, it is foundational. Um, and in fact, it's found in Zeno of Cytium, the founder of Stoicism. Oh, so this is one that's in all the Stoicism. It's, all, it's in all the Stoics, all the way from the beginning. Uh, of course, of Zeno, we have only fragments, so and quoted by other, you know, quoted by other later authors. But it is in Zeno as well. It is most prominent in Epictetus. Uh, in fact, the manual, the Enchiridion, uh, starts out with the dichotomy of control. It says famously, Epictetus says, you know, some things are under your control, other things are not under your control, and then it goes on list, does two things that are important. It lists the kind of things that are under your control, and the ones that are not, and then it says what it, 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 it makes what I call Epictetus promise, he, he tells you what is going to happen uh, if you actually understand and internalize. And those are two different things because it's easy to, intend, to understand the dichotomy of control. It's much more difficult to internalize it. It requires a lot of exercise, right? So he says that things that are under your control are your judgments, uh, your actions, your behaviors. And things that are not under your control is pretty much everything else, right? So the outcome of your actions is not under your control because presumably... Uh, that outcome depends not just on what you do, but also what other people are going to do, right? And on, on external circumstances. So it's not un completely under your control. The, the classic stoic metaphor is the one of the archer. Uh, so, yeah, I want to talk to you uh, about that metaphor. So go ahead and explain so, it. So the metaphor of the archer is that, he, that let's say I am an archer and I'm trying to hit, hit a, um, a target. Well, what is up to me is to practice in order to hit, you know, to do the best that I can to hit the target. It is to get the best arrows that I can, the best bow that I can, to be very focused when I'm about to, you know, let the arrow go. But once the arrow leave, leaves my, my bow, then the outcome is not up to me because, you know, all sorts of things can happen. The target can move. Uh, there can be a, you know, wind that moves the, the arrow in an unexpected way and I'm going to miss the target. And that's why Cicero, who actually explains this metaphor in uh, the Finibus, which is a, a dialogue with Cato the Younger, who was one of the prominent Stoics, where Cicero has Cato explain the basics of Stoicism. And uh, Cato in that dialogue says, you know, so hitting the target is to be preferred but not to be desired. Meaning that, uh, that yeah, of course, what, that, that you prefer to hit the target as opposed to not hitting the target, just like I say in the book, you prefer to have a uh, promotion at, at, at work or you prefer for your wife to, to love you or you prefer a number of things. You gave the uh, example of your own weight loss. That's right. Pages exactly. 36 to 37. I thought that was really interesting. I, exactly. part, of it's, part of it made me crack up a little bit because <laughs> from my position, for you to complain about your weight is, is vaguely <laughs> offensive. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> well, you know, but it's but right. I like the example because it's um, the arrow example is, you know, about something that's a bit, a bit abstract, but the, this is something everybody or a lot of people can identify. So right. the idea is that you you don't you desire your effort. Right. Exactly. You don't desire the outcome because the outcome there are elements that determine the outcome that you have no control over at all. Exactly. Exactly. So typically, you know, for instance in the case of weight loss, right? So sure, I can uh, what is up to me is to 
uh, adopt as much as I can a healthy diet, uh, you know, exercise, do, do all the right things. But ultimately, the outcome depends on a number of things. First of all, do I have access to healthy diets? Lots of people don't. You know, one of the reasons, allegedly at least, for the uh, so-called uh, obesity it's epidemics in the United States. Our food deserts. Yeah. It's the food deserts, yeah, right? Yeah. So the fact that you, if you can't, uh, if you don't have access to it, what are you going to do? Yeah. Uh, that's not outside of your control. Your metabolism is outside of your control. Your genetic makeup is outside of your control. I mean, there are, there are these people out there who eat three triple cheeseburgers a day and then don't gain a pound. I hate, the, I hate those people. I know, right? I hate those people, right? <laughs> and then there are people who just look at a, at a cheeseburger and they already start putting on weight. So all of those things are not under your control. And the idea is that if you actually internalize uh, that distinction, which, by the way, is found also in other traditions. That's another one of those things that's found in other traditions. I mentioned there in the book it's found in medieval jewish philosophy it's found in buddhist philosophy and of course it's found in the serenity prayer the christian yeah. serenity yeah, prayer yeah, right yeah, yeah. and the idea is that if you actually internalize this is also by the way one of the foundational um uh, concepts behind uh, cbt cognitive behavioral therapy and similar kinds of therapies right now the the issue of course, of course is that the first step is cognitive that is you have to understand that that is the case the dichotomy of control has to sink in at a sort of an intellectual, at a cognitive level. It's like, yes, I agree. Some things are under my control. Other things are not under my control. Just like when you go to a 12-step program, you know, Alcoholic Anonymous, the first thing you say is, I am an alcoholic, right? That is a sign that you have understood that there is a problem. You have understood that this is, in fact, a problem and you need to do something about it. But, of course, as anybody who goes to a 12-step program will tell, it's not that understanding immediately uh, implies behavior modification. The behavior modification is the result of trial and error and, and a practice, right? That's why you need people to remind you of doing certain things. You and that's techniques. why stoicism has all these disciplines, these practices. Correct. Because otherwise it doesn't work. It's not enough to know it. No. Definitely. You have to practice you it. You have to the, practice. Yeah. That's yeah, yeah, why yeah. the book ends with the, with the practices. spiritual exercises, which yeah. are actually you know, practices. There's yeah. 12 in them that I selected. Uh, I'm now actually working uh, on a book proposal with a friend of mine, uh, Greg Lopez, uh, to do a book of 52 stoic exercises, only about exercises. How many books Nothing are you going to do? You are, we're supposed to do a book too. I mean, how many books can you do, man? <laughs> um, I, uh, uh, as my grandmother would say, uh, you'll rest when you're dead. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> okay, so, so let me ask you, the, the reason for adopting, not just knowing, but internalizing, the reason why you want to focus, you want to desire your efforts and not the outcomes is ultimately what? To avoid psychic pain? To avoid disappointment? To avoid, what's, the, what's the reason? That's what an Epicurean will say. Um, so tell me what the reason the, is for... Yeah, the Stoics would say, would say something similar, but again, it will spin it in a more positive way. Um, I mean, the, the goal, in fact, it's more than what I think. Epictetus explicitly says... Uh, uh, that in, in the, the, the third part of that little bit in the, in the Enchiridion that just mentioned, right? So it starts out with telling you some things that are under your control and other things are not. Then it gives you the list of things that are that fall in either category. And then it gives you uh, what I call Epictetus promise. The Epictetus promise is if you do that, right, if you really internalize uh, that notion of the dichotomy of control, then you will achieve serenity. You will have your... What does you that achieve mean? It, you will achieve an, an uh, a, um, attitude of equanimity toward whatever life throws at you. So you will always react in a positive way, not in the modern sense of you know, positive psychology, hey, things are always good and all that sort of stuff, but in a way like, well, I appreciate what I have, uh, but if I don't get something, that's okay. That means that the world decided, the universe decided that that wasn't going to be the case. And I'm okay with it. Isn't that I, sort of circular? In what sense? I should be equanimous so that I can achieve equanimity? <laughs> no, no. I should internally. Yeah, that's right. No, that would definitely be circular. <laughs> no, I think the idea, I think the promise is you should be, you, you want to achieve equanimity because it's, you know, you, lo you go through life in a much more emotionally so serene way. You, you are able to, uh, to take on problems. In a, in a more effective way. And the way you do that is by practicing the dichotomy of control. And by the way... Let me ask you, uh, is, it, is, it yeah. is, it, is it a bit consequentialist then? Are you saying, in a sense, what they're saying is the reason why you don't want to desire the outcomes but you want to desire uh, your, your efforts is because 
as a practical matter, if you can attain this kind of state of equanimity and serenity, you actually will handle problems better. Is that is that does it does it have a yeah. consequentialist dimension to it? it? It has a consequentialist dimension, but that doesn't make it a consequentialist philosophy, of course, because no, 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 uh, I wasn't suggesting right, yeah, that. Right, yeah, yeah, right, because I mean, one of the things that often people uh, notice about virtual ethics in general, not just stories, is that oh, but it has a sort of uh, consequentialist aspect to it. Well, yes, of course, it, it also has. If you, if you will, deontological aspects to it, because if you say, if you say to somebody that you ought to practice the discipline of action, desire, and assent, then yeah, you're basically yeah, yeah. being, you know, uh, yeah. ontological about it. I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> deontological about it. Yeah, yeah. No, there's a reason I'm, I'm asking this because this is one of the areas where I, I, I felt I, want, I really wanted to push back the most, and it, it may be that my objections are due to a misunderstanding. Um, um, so here, here, here's the. I, I was I was meditating on the as I was thinking about <laughs> as I was thinking about you see it's already starting to rub off as I was thinking about the archer example and about yeah. the um the weight loss example I thought to myself you know is there a little bit of a, a a little bit of bullshit going on here in the following way I mean you're not playing you're not engaging in archery to try to hit the target you're engaging in archery to hit the target in other words. The only reason you're making the effort is to attain the outcome. And so isn't it a little disingenuous to say that you're not desiring the outcome? Of course you're desiring the outcome. And if you're not desiring the outcome, then you're not fully invested in the activity, right? That's the reason for making the effort in the, in the first place. That's why you get the bow. That's why yeah. you get the arrows. Yes. So it, it, am I missing something or is there a bit of a... Uh, no, I think I did not explain myself correctly uh, or, or fully. First of all, that phrase comes from Cicero. I just love that phrase. You know, the, the outcome is to be uh, preferred but not desired. Um, but we shouldn't really get stuck on that one because that's no, and I don't Cicero's think it's right. crucial because. And so I think that what a better way to put it, especially in sort of in modern terms, uh, is simply that of course you want to hit the target, uh, but should you not, should you fail to hit the target, you should accept that outcome with equanimity instead of say getting pissed off and wasting a lot of energy about saying oh the universe you know why did the universe not allow me to, to, to hit the target right um so that's the idea yes of course you want to hit the target of course i want to lose weight of, of course i want to uh, get a promotion of course i want my partner to love me but should any of those things not happen not because of my efforts because i'm doing remember i'm doing the best i can in order to achieve those those results right but should any of those things not happen, then what am I going to do? Make it even more miserable on myself by, by just basically throwing a tantrum? I mean, in some sense, Epictetus is saying, you know, behave like a human being. Like it's an very practical. Being. It's, it's, yeah. it's not, it, yeah, here's why, why this matters so much to me. So um, I read your How to Be a Stoic blog. Mm -hmm. um, I don't comment over there, um, um, but I read over there. And there was one post that, that you had that really kind of upset me and and I'm wondering now if I, I misunder if, if it's because of this misunderstanding you had a woman for people who don't know there'll be a link to this you really should go over to this how to be a star lab because one of the things that that Massimo does is he runs a dear Abby column <laughs> that's right <laughs> which is this column. freaking awesome um, um, is a great idea by the way um, to do Thank you. Um, you could probably commercialize that. I mean, that's just really interesting. <laughs> ask ask a stoic. But you had one exchange with a woman, which where you said something that really kind of upset me, and I wanted to bring it up with you. And and it was, I bet you you know what it was. Um, she was expressing really profound sadness about being unable to have children. Right. And in the course of counseling her stoically. Yeah. You said that you thought of your own daughter as a preferred indifferent. Right. This, you know how I get. This pissed me <laughs> off. I think I was mad for weeks after reading this, and I was waiting for the opportunity. Now, here's why. Okay. So, and please tell me, tell me how the stoic way of thinking about this is to make to make to, to make me feel better about this. To me, it's precisely the amount of pain you feel when something happens to someone you care about a lot, that's a sign of how invested you are in the relationship. In other sure. words, if, if, if my daughter died, for God's sake, 
I'd be absolutely devastated. And the reason sure. I'd be absolutely devastated is precisely because I fully invested in my relationship with her. If sure. my marriage to my wife went south and we wound up getting divorced, I'd be devastated because, and that would be a sign of how much invested. Sure. It can, it looks an awful lot like the Stoics. They're not telling you not to have relationships, right. but they're telling you not to invest in them too much. Right. In the sense that, that, be prepared for them to be gone. And if they are gone or they get destroyed or something, react right. with equanimity. Now, to me, someone who's not, in, in, who, has, who doesn't fall apart if their daughter dies, right. I would say there's something wrong with this person, right? Yeah. So what is the, am I misunderstanding or is there an element to the Stoics that we kind of have to take with a grain of salt and say, okay, you know, they're a little. Yeah. So you are, well, first of all, yes, the, the problem, there's always a grain of salt, I think, in any, to, to, in, in the way which you want to take a philosophy any, philosophy, of life. Any, any philosophy. And also remember, one thing is what the ancient Stoics were saying, one thing is what I'm saying as a 21st century Stoic. Right, right. That said, um, your, react, your reaction is perfectly uh, uh, normal. And in fact, it's one of the main problems that Stoicism has. It's, it's, it's got this image that, oh, Stoicism is about suppressing emotions and it's like right. an in inhuman Or at philosophy. least not investing in them too much. I don't want right. to caricature it. I'm not trying right. to do that. Right. No, no, I know that. I know you're not. But, so first of all, I have to tell you, my daughter read that column and she it's, said, yeah, dad, exactly. Well, that you said that in the column. You're like, well, my daughter's a cool chick. She won't mind me saying this, right? So, um, so I got um, upset on her behalf, right? Right. <laughs> um, so, but what that means, I think, is this. So uh, there, I think the best author, so Epictetus, Epictetus really a lot, in some cases, sounds a lot like what you're talking about. He really does sound, I don't take him actually literally to be that way, but it does sound a lot in certain passages. Like don't in invest too much. Be, like, prepared. You know, yeah, yeah. Eh, be prepared to just let it go, right? Um, but Seneca, I think, is a better author there. So Seneca wrote three letters of consolation to mm -hmm. friends who had lost something. One of one, well, actually, one of, uh, of them was to his mother on, uh, because of his, uh, she was suffering from his own exile, from Seneca's exile. But the other two are to uh, Marsha, who was a friend who lost a son, and to Polybius, who was a friend who lost a brother, right? And I think that if you read those letters, I actually have a, a commentary on each one of the three letters of consolation on, on my blog, so people can go and check it. Um, if you read those letters, it's very clear, I think, what the attitude is. Seneca over and over says, of course you're distraught about this thing. You'd be inhuman if you were not distraught. It would mean that you wouldn't, didn't care about your son or your, your brother. And, and what kind of a monster would you be if you didn't, right? But, he says, that said, at some point, you want a healing process. Right, so he writes to uh, to um, uh, Marsha particularly because Marsha had kept um, being sort of in in uh, uh, grief for more than two years mm. after the death of her son, and she was basically mm. incapable of doing anything else. She was essentially she she's given up uh, the rest of her life. She was just grieving her son. That's it. And so in, in Seneca says, "This is why I'm writing to you now, because now you pass the mark." Now you're going from, as we would say in modern terms, from grief as a natural process to grief as self-indulgence. Right? Now you need to snap back and accept, as they will say with equanimity, that you know, this is the way the world works, unfortunately. We're all, we're all mortal, and as much as it is ter terrible to lose your, your son, other people have. He tells, he tells her of another uh, patrician woman who had gone through a very similar thing, but she had reacted. And she said, okay, I'm grieving for my son, but I also have other children to take care of. I have my husband to take care of. I have my, you know, things that I want to do in society and in life, and I need to snap out of it to come out of it. So I think that that is the idea. And so the, reading the, the stoic, um, the economy of control in, in a charitable way, which as you know, as philosophers, which you always do, as opposed to sort of a caricature in the worst possible way, is that the idea is, look, equanimity, going through life to work with equanimity doesn't mean that you don't care. It doesn't mean you don't- It's mean not a lack right. of grief. It's, it's, an, and it's an attempt to keep these things healthy. Is that sort That's of- That's right, exactly. It's to keep yeah. it within the, the bounds of healthy, normal human reactions, as opposed to as somebody sometimes is in fact the case so becoming a self uh, uh perpetuating emotion and and essentially a paralyzing emotion right? yeah. yeah yeah you know in judaism there's a practice so when somebody dies 
the bereaved person sits in their home for seven days. It's called sitting Shiva. Shiva is seven in Hebrew. And what's supposed to happen is that friend, there's supposed to be a continuous stream of friends and families that come over mm -hmm. uh, to talk and sit with the person. Right. And that, in a sense, this is, the, this is the healthy period of bereavement. And after that, you are supposed exactly. to go back to your life. Exactly. Um, and it's symbolically represented. You do actually go back to your life. You withdraw from it for seven days. In the sense, almost the religion is saying, we acknowledge yep. that this loss is devastating and a normal person it should not be able to operate for, for a period of time. That's and right. then you go back to your life. You go back to your job. You go back to all of this. Sort of stuff. It's, and so really what this is about I almost think equanimity is an unfortunate word. I mean, this is really about the healthy expression of emotions is what sure. this really is about. Yes, 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 that's um, right. Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, I, the, the reason I like the word equanimity uh, is m more general because it doesn't apply just to these kind of situations, but to you know, accepting any outcome that you have no control over. So it, it, to me, equanimity simply means that uh, you realize that you don't control the universe. You, you, you reject, you know, you remember this, this uh, crazy notion that came out a few years ago, like the, the, the secret, this idea that um, if you just will something uh, badly enough, the universe somehow yeah, will, yeah, will yeah, twist yeah. around. Well, in Epictetus, there is a, a passage where he almost seems to, uh, to, to speak directly against the, 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 the secret. Uh, there is, um, I think, one of his students Who's, uh, who is complaining about the fact that he's, that he's lame, that, it, that, he's lag, that it, his lag doesn't work well. And, and to keep things in perspective, remember that Epictetus himself was lame, right? And uh, at some point, Epictetus snaps and says to his students, look, what do you want? To rearrange the universe for the sake of a broken leg? It's like, okay, it has happened. I'm sure it hurt. I'm yeah. sure this is not an ideal situation. But hey, you've got a life. You, yeah. You're still alive. You can still do lots yeah. of stuff. And you know what do you what do you what do you want? You want to change things. Uh, you you might have noticed that one of my uh, recent columns was actually about a, a really serious situation of a woman who's dying of cancer. It's, 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 she's been yeah, numb. I read that. Well, that was you actually know, pretty hard to read. I that thought. was very hard to read, and and I took it you know with a little bit of hesitation because it's kind of a very hard thing to do to write to somebody like that. I was actually going to say that writing a column like that has got to be pretty. I don't know. I don't. I, I don't know if I. I would think that's. I would feel too too responsible. Yeah, um, um, it's 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 a hard thing to do, especially with some of those those situations. I mean, I, one thing is if somebody like the one the one that just came out. It's about job hunting. Okay, you know, whatever. But if it is about you know, end I'm of dying. life situation, or I'm <laughs> yeah. dying, some some or or another one was about somebody who has been uh, diagnosed with schizophrenia and who he may he, he he's afraid that he's going to come back in sort of full full blown. So he's literally going to lose his mind. Those are hard. But at the same time, if I really believe that, uh, that Stoicism is a practically useful philosophy, then I have to take on those things. I, that's the way I feel about it. Because otherwise, it's just too easy. It's just a, you know, a, a, a number of platitudes. It's a fashion. And, 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 right. yeah, yeah, and yeah. as I say in both of those columns, both the, the cancer and the schizophrenia one, look, uh, it's not like uh, Stoicism is a, is a silver bullet. It's a magic wand. Uh, it's not the secret. It's not like you, you say, oh, I'm a stoic, therefore I can overcome cancer or, or schizophrenia. No, you can't. Uh, it, it, in fact, it's about how you handle it and how you think about it, um, not, not the fact, about the fact that you can somehow magically wish it away. But that woman was complaining uh, that she gets a lot of these positive thinking kind of things. It's like, oh, you should think positively, otherwise you're going to die. And she says, I am going to die. I'm going to die anyway. It doesn't matter what I, in fact, I'd rather take the thing, you know, take an attitude, which again, I would, I would um, characterize uh, as equanimity uh, in, with respect to the universe. She says, I'd rather understand what's happening, what the timing is, and then focus on the stuff that I can still do still spend some time with my children and with my husband, still do things that are useful to society for whatever time is left for me to do that, rather than sort of go in, uh, into, into fights, uh, a flight of fancy where I can imagine that just by sheer willpower I can overcome a biological problem like, like cancer. And, and I, to me, that is the positive aspect of, uh, sort of what I call equanimity. So, I mean, I do think... See this the way we discuss it now strikes me as much you know it's something that I can certainly accept and 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 don't feel uncomfortable with. I think that maybe in that sense rhetorically though, 
um, Stoicism, it's important, especially for something like Stoicism, to acknowledge and kind of give credit to uh, the, the, the experience of grief, right? Yes. Um, and of loss, and, of, and because otherwise it sounds too much like, get over it. Right. Um, this you couldn't control it anyway. That sort of thing, and 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 and, and I, I think it's better cast as sort of. That's not it at all. There's you know, and, and you said Seneca is more rhetorically uh, uh, is rhetorically much better than this than than Epictetus is. That's right. Um, and you know, in Judaism, I think I think one of the things, and maybe the religions just do this a little better. That's because they have more resources because they're not just philosophies of life, but. Sure. You know, in Judaism, there's not just the ritual practice of the of the that manages the grief in a way that allows it its sort of healthy arc and then sort of ends it, but then there's also an annual kind of uh, uh, ritual where you remember the dead, and right. so on the dates of the date of your loved one's death, you go to the when you go to the synagogue that week, you tell the rabbi, and the rabbi reads their name in a roll. Right, and so there is even afterwards a re-engagement with the grief, but again yes. in a structured way that assures that it remains healthy. So there's simultaneously an acknowledgement of the emotion, right. but at the same time a, a clear normative, healthy, resilient version. The Stoicism has practices that specifically surround, yeah, the emotional experiences. Question. So Stoicism per se doesn't have anything like that. But remember, you know, Stoicism was of course embedded into Roman society, and Roman society did. Yeah. Um, one of the, the the things that I've actually uh, sort of, in a sense, picked up myself, uh, and to do it every year. So every year during the uh, period of Saturnalia, which is the period right before Christmas, uh, according to the Roman calendar. Uh, for a week, you're supposed to do a number of things, and the, you know, the Romans did a number of things. And one of the things that they did was to pay homage to the Lares. The Lares were the ancestors. And so they had a place in the house, special place in the house, where they had images of their ancestors. Uh, and they would there and you know, make offerings, you know, put a little bit of milk and a little bit of wine and a uh, and, and little uh, candle, things like that. Um, I find that very a very good idea. It's it's an it's a ritual reminder of the fact that you're connected to other people that are now gone, and um, and I actually do it in my in my house, in my apartment. I have uh, of course modern version, so I have an iPad with photos of my uh, uh, parents and grandparents and, and you know, things like that. And uh, it's nice to have it for a few days. It, the, the, the interesting thing is that it's, it's a healthy sort of, way of reminding yourself of the loss, that's right? right? That's right. Um, and the idea is to do it. You do it only for a few days because otherwise you get numb to it. You get or you it. dwell. You become morbid. Or you dwell. That's right. Yeah, yes. yeah. Either way, you either dwell on it or you start, just get used to it and it's not an important thing anymore. It doesn't like have it. the effect. Yeah. It doesn't have yeah. the effect. Yeah. 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 So, so the, this last thing, and I, I think we've done a really good survey and we've also had a good give and, give and take. Um, and I've asked you this before, but you're so much more advanced now in this now. It sounds to me like you're saying, because this isn't a religion, it's not going to be enough by itself. In other words, this, in, in other words, you're going to a religion has a philosophy of life embedded in it, but it also has right. all of these lifestyle dimensions, yes. um, and and ritual practices that that have a function. It sounds to me like the stoicism is going to have to be wedded with something, right? It's either going to have to, you're either going to have to, it's going to have to weld with a, a religion right. or in your case, it sounds to me like you're trying to ac adopt practices that make sense with it, but are outside of it. Like this thing that you said you're getting from the old Roman, the old Roman yes. customs. That's it, right. But by itself, a philosophy of life by itself is not enough. No, a yeah. philosophy of life. I think it's a guide, but it isn't the whole structure. Right. So you still you still do need structures and you do get you're right. You get those structures out of uh, either familiar relationships or relations to your friends or whatever it is or a religious environment. Absolutely. Just like the Romans did. Yeah. Like the Romans, you know, the, the Greeks and the Romans were living a structured social life within certain uh, certain, in a certain way. On, and, and then they superimposed their philosophy uh, to that particular structure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, again, I don't want to oversell stoicism as, okay, the answer to everything that, that is going on in your life. No, it's just a compass. It gives you a general, it's a map of the territory and how to navigate it. You still need other stuff to navigate the territory. You know, if you, if you have a map, 
you still need in order to actually walk around you still need shoes and clothes and you know and and uh water canteen and things like that yeah. so you do need yeah. other things and you need probably and you certainly need help from other people yeah 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 i was gonna say you need you may need to ask people questions even if you have the map um um and somebody um, has to produce the water or, or the canteen and so on and yeah, so forth, right? So yeah. we, we have to we have to rely yeah. on other people. Okay, well, I think I think we did a good job. Um, I will. The audience <laughs> obviously will ultimately decide this. Um, but yes. um, again, the book is How to Be a Stoic. Uh, it's yes. already available in the Let UK. Let me show it again. It's already available in the UK and in Italy, um, though under different publishers. Um, um, yes. It's America. It's Basic Books. England. It's Penguin. And I guess Italy is an Italian press. Yeah, in Italy is the Garzanti uh, publisher. Did, did you do the Italian translation, or did somebody else do it? No, uh, no, the Italian translation was done by a um, uh, somebody who is actually a faculty at the University of Venice, uh, and he was very, very good. I have to say. Did you um, read it? Have you taken a look yes. at it? Are you are you yes. happy with the translation? Yes, I'm very happy with the Italian translation. Uh, uh, the, the translator really managed to get the right sort of voice out um but no i didn't write it on my own bec uh, because that would have essentially a ton of work a book. yeah yeah it's, a, it's running a second i don't book. know how natural your italian is and probably to write a book in italian would even be a challenge for you at this point probably yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah my italian is very good but it, but it would be a major challenge to do it so yeah it's like, yeah. yeah well congratulations massimo Thank it's you. a big deal and it's and it's really uh, it's a beautiful book I, I strongly recommend it i really enjoyed reading it and um, uh, I'll see you around these parts Absolutely. again soon. <laughs> All yes. right, Massimo, take care of yourself. You too. Bye-bye.